What a blessing to be in the house of the Lord tonight. We got an awesome crowd here tonight. Praise Jesus. The Lord is doing something great right now in the lives of, of, of everybody. I'm not just saying men, the lives of women and children, teenagers. God is doing something mighty right now. And let me tell you, it's important that we as men understand that. Especially if you see something begin to move uh, in, a, in, a, in a spiritual way with your children or grandchildren or your spouse, you need to be able to begin to, uh, to, to, to raise that, to nurture it. You need to be able to see that. Don't miss it. As a man, we have to have that spiritual eye and that discernment to be able to see that. Those around you, if you've got distant family members that you hear accepted Christ or God, to do, you need to reach out to them to social media, email. I don't care if it's old facts or text or whatever you got to do. You reach out to them and encourage them in what God is doing in their life because God is doing something powerful right now. And if you begin to speak that way, you'll, be, you'll begin to see the hand of God move in you in a mighty way because you're being obedient to what he's telling you to do. Even if it's out of your, your norm, even if it's out of your norm, begin to speak it and you just watch what God's going to do. You know, God, like I said, God is doing something mighty, but I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. God, well, don't get me wrong. No disrespect. But I'm not satisfied. I'm praying that, that the backslider is going to come running back to God. I'm praying for those that are not just a backslider, but those individuals, men and women and people that have been rejecting God and say no, that will all of a sudden be in a position to, to run to, to Christ. Just last week, Gerald and I were ministering to a brother right in the front of the, in the Wilson by the, by the ticket booth. We were working the ticket booth. And the first question I asked him, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you want to accept Jesus? He straight up said no. For about 10, 15 minutes, Gerald and I were, were, were talking to him and ministering to him, and he still kept saying no and no and no. And Gerald will tell you, he's right there. He's a witness. And Gerald pumped him. Gerald, Gerald drilled him as well, and Gerald was on him, and Gerald was, man, we were both on him. And at the end, he, he was real nice, and, and he, but he said nope. I said, brother, what if you just go right here? Right? I said, what if you turn a corner right here, walk in, a car hits you? I go, do you know where you're going to go? He said, no. And he still said no. Didn't want to pray for him. I'm praying. See, those are, those are, the, those are the ones that are, I'm not going to start on my message yet, but those are the ones that, that, um, that when the Lord calls it, he'll make you fishers of men. Yes. Those are the men that are not just, like I said before, just the fish that we need to reach, but those are, those are the rock cod that are like three, 400 feet deep. The ones that don't even want light. They don't want to come to the surface. They're the ones that you got you to gotta cast that down, you know, 50, 200, two-foot strokes. You got to go down four, 500 feet. You got to be creative to be a fisher of man, of that type of man, and a woman that's saying, nah, I never want Christ. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta sit that 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 bait down deep. Once again, I'm not satisfied. I'm praying that God is going to reach them in a mighty, mighty way. Those have been rejecting God. Let me tell you how I'm not satisfied. I've been praying for the, I've been president for, praying for the president Joe Biden and 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 then Kamala Harris. I've been praying. I pray for them every night. I pray for them earnestly. I pray that that they will get saved. And I pray that they will get filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Because just imagine. Let me tell you, I pray, for the, I pray for Nancy Pelosi, I pray for Maxine Waters, I pray for Chuck Schumer. And I say, God, in the name of Jesus, save their soul. And I say, God, I'm not satisfied. Fill them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. Imagine if Nancy Pelosi got saved and got filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Why not? Why not? And watch what God will do. I'm not satisfied. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your presence in this place, Lord God. Forgive me of all my sins, for I am a sinner. Have your way, Father. I surrender my will to you every day, Lord God. I go before you. The only way I know how, Father, to seek you, to serve you, to bid your will, Lord God. Anoint these lips of flesh and blood to speak your word, not man's, not my ideas, not man's or my principles, but you, your word according to your word, Father. If it's not of your word, I want nothing to do with it, Lord God. Open our eyes and our minds to hear, our hearts, Father, to have an understanding, a discernment, Father. Thank you in advance for this miracle, what you're going to do with every individual that is here tonight. Have your way, for you are the King, you are the Lord, you are the Savior. 
In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. And once again, I said, I'm not satisfied. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for individuals that not just those that are rejecting God or backslidden, but for us men, that we will be in a position to understand how to be able to move in the spirit and not move in the flesh. That everything we decide to do will be through God's discernment, that the decisions we make will glorify him and everything, that he will be pleased with our words, that he will be pleased with how we treat our family and our loved ones, that everything we do will glorify him. You know, as I was praying, I entitled this message, um, Looking Back. And the reason being is because the Lord gave me a revelation to show me how, once again, I've talked about this before, but the way the Lord gave this to me tonight is a little different, how so many men and women are still looking back in their past with a desire. They're looking back for a moment with a desire. I've seen in, in the history, the time I've been here all these years, I've been serving the Lord. I've seen men, well, let me talk about single men and single women too. I've seen them in love with God, involved in ministry, faithful in the church, what I thought was really committed. And all of a sudden, they've been praying for a helpmate. They've been praying. They, everybody, at least everybody, I know why, at least they, they should want to be married. Praise God, amen, praise Jesus. And they're praying for a helpmate. And all of a sudden, the Lord gives them one as single people that seem to love God, involved in ministry. And next thing you know, those two disappear. And they're no longer in ministry. And they're gone from the church, and I don't see them anymore. What? Let me tell you. I've had brothers buy a bass, bass boats. And all of a sudden now, because of this nice fishing boat they have now, they're fishing with all their old school friends. Brothers that love God. Faithful to the Lord. Now they got a bass boat, and they're hanging out with all their old buddies that they used to hang out with back in the days. Next thing you know, they're back to square one. Tore up. Marriage tore up. Kids tore up. Their finances tore up. Yeah. I've seen brothers that love God and buy a motorcycle. Nothing wrong with a motorcycle. Nothing at all. They buy a motorcycle and they start giving rides to sisters and women. They ain't got no business giving rides to. All of a sudden, they're giving rides to sisters they ain't got no business giving rides to. One specific situation, not saying no names. Happened to an individual. Later on, weeks later, I seen him. Where you been, brother? What's going on? You know, I see him, and he's got hickeys all over his neck. And I say, brother, what's going on? Where have you been doing? And he goes, well, ever since I got that bike. Like the other brother, ever since I got that bass boat. And ever since I met that girl. We can't blame someone or something for the decision you chose to make. You can't blame anybody. You can't even blame the devil for the decisions you and I have chosen to make deliberately. Premeditated decision. Well, it was that bass boat. It wasn't the bass boat. You're sitting with that bass boat? Give it to me, brothers. I'll use it for the glory of God. Amen. I ain't playing. Think I'm playing? We can't blame anything. Like it's not even the devil for the decisions you and I are making. We need to accept responsibility and understand who we are in Christ and understand who you are not in Christ. It's awesome to understand who you are in Christ, but let me tell you, if you understand who you are not, you know what direction you need to go. You know where you need to be. You know, you know every one of us knows what, need, what we need to do. You can't, you, can't, you can't blame anything or anybody. Luke chapter 9, 62 says this. Jesus replied, no one puts his hand to the plow and looks back. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. He's not talking about salvation. Everybody has asked. It's a free gift. Salvation is a free gift. But he's talking about that individual that keeps looking back is not fit for service in the kingdom of God. Stay with me. 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. If they have escaped corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were in the, at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have it 
and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them, the Proverbs are true. A dog returns to his vomit and a sow that is washed goes back to her wallowing in the mud. The, the, the scripture is very clear. It doesn't make you guess. It is very clear. Galatians 4, 8 and 9 says this. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those whom by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? Let me tell you, gentlemen, if that scripture, the context of what God is giving you to say, is making you uncomfortable, it's getting you mad, then praise God, the word of God is working. If it's making you kick and buck, praise the Lord, then it's working. The reason why that's working that way, because look what Hebrews Chapter 4, verses 12 and 13 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit. Joins... Dividing soul and spirit. Joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. See, sometimes individuals get lost spiritually and have a hard time finding their way back. You know, sometimes on this journey, once again, not a destination, but on this journey in Christ that way. We encounter things that will distract us. But as men of God, we don't need to understand those distractions. You know, sometimes on this road, we see things from right and left, and it distracts us, and we will veer off the road. Or sometimes we look back and we reflect, as I said, on our past. And we begin to desire our past. When we get lost, we're not deliberately trying to get lost. Well, nobody ever trying to do that. For many, it is a gradual, small increments that sometimes we feel like we didn't even know it was happening because we compromise in these small, small increments that way. These small that we seem to think that they're, they're insignificant and it doesn't matter. So what causes us to look back and many times to go back to our past, back to Egypt? Not in, not in order of, of how they should be, but the first one I put down is spending time with the wrong people. Spending time with the wrong people. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I have people say, Pastor, really pray for me, because when I'm with my friends at their house, they're always pressuring me to drink. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. I'm going to pray that you start making better decisions who you're hanging out with. Why would I pray for you not to drink when you put yourself in that position with all the same friends? That's all? Let me tell you, if you have old school friends or even Christian people that you think are serving God and they like to get busy doing something, if you're going to hang out with them, they're going to get busy around you. If, if, if you're kicking and bucking because they want to smoke weed or do dope in front of you, then don't be around them. You got to make that decision. Don't get me wrong, you might cut them loose, but I guarantee you sooner or later, they're going to hit a wall. And when that fan hits a fertilizer, I guarantee you they're going to come back to you. They're going to come back to you saying, you know what, out of all the people, I know you've been one that has been faithful to God and you reached out to me and, 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 and for you to have done, I was mad at you because you cut me loose as your friend and we grew up to get a work on bus and you cut me loose. But now I understand why, I guarantee you they're going to come back to you. Because you cut them loose in reality for the glory of God. But remember, cutting them loose doesn't mean treat them like a leper. They can come out and hang with you in your house, but you have a standard in your house. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And you're not going to, if, if, if you, you can go to their barbecue, it's all right. It don't matter how they live their life. But if they're going to be pressuring you, I don't even got a problem if, if people are drinking around me. I'm cool with that. But it doesn't mean I, I condone that. But I'm not going to pull out my Bible and say, in the name of Jesus, brother. I'm not going to condemn them like that. 
I'm going to love them and I'm going to bless them so that they'll say, I want him to come back. Because I guarantee you sooner or later, I guarantee you sooner or later they're going to know Jesus. They're going to stand in a position of repentance, acknowledging Christ. And I, once again, I'm not satisfied. That's good, but I'm not satisfied with that. I want them to be baptized with the Holy Ghost with the power and the evidence of speaking in tongues. I want the Spirit of God to move in their life in a mighty way that will consume them, that they will no longer be the same as they were. They'll begin to speak with authority and power. God's raising people up like that, people that are willing. People that are willing. God is moving in their lives in a mighty, mighty way. So what, also, what, what can also cause for us to take our eyes off of Christ? I'll tell you like this. Some of you might like it, but it's true. Not all of them, but some of them. Is your wife. Yeah. Not all, not all the wives that we have are women of God. Some are straight up Lucifer. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm just telling you what I know, brothers. It might not be anybody's wife here, but it might be somebody that's listening tonight on the, online. But I can tell you, some of them sisters will pull out them canines and... <laughs> Look at 1 Kings 11, 4 says, As Solomon grew old, his wives... But because it's his wife doesn't mean you don't go, don't go more... Don't, don't. Don't. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods. And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. King Solomon had direct, direct conversations with God, and he was blessed, direct communication. He was blessed of the Lord, and the Lord gave him wisdom above measure to distinguish between right and wrong and good and evil, to give godly, discerned counsel. But the woman jacked him up. The woman jacked him up. So just because she is your wife, it does not mean you're going to adhere to all her principles. Once again, I've said it before, be very careful with that. It's up to you to, to help her in the spiritual condition she is or she is not. But you never allow anyone, including your spouse, to dictate who you are in Christ. You never let them sway who you are. Never allow that. I don't care how fine she looks. I don't care what leverage she tries to use. Do not let her or anyone dictate who you are in Christ. That should not sway you ever. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. If she don't want to go to church, I love you, honey, but I'm, I'm out of here. You're staying home, praise God. Yeah. That, that's praise the Lord. You, you, you don't want to go to church Sunday morning? Don't say, well, she don't want to go. Praise God. Leave her home, brother. Tell her, you need to have breakfast when I get back. Amen. Praise God. Glory. Don't get all... Don't get all limp or something, brothers. <laughs> so what, what causes us to look back? What causes us to backslide? Number three that I put down. Once again, not necessarily in order. Angry people. Watch this. Proverbs 22, 24 and 25. Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered. Or you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. Ensnared means... You walked on it, you didn't even know. It just snagged you up. Yeah, it just snagged you up. In other words, you were ensnared. You didn't even know, so to speak. You, just, you were just hanging out with him, and he's hot-tempered. The next you know, you're backing him up in a fight. You're in a Fresno County jail. Yeah. Oh, I don't know what happened. I just got cold. He got, I got cold, and I started fighting back. You're in the county jail. Be very careful that way. A lot of people deal with anger. Religion. When through neglect, you just become religious with no relationship. And when religion begins to, to, to cease to satisfy, you revert backward. Because you have no real relationship. You have nothing in hope because everything is based just on religious and what people see and what you think we have to do that way, and you've got no relationship. And pretty soon, you get tired of religion. It doesn't work that way because it's not a personal relationship. And because of that, that gets old real fast. And if you don't have a relationship, you just revert back to what you understand. Because remember, we will always default back to the, to the darkness. This flesh will always default to the, what's negative. The flesh will always default to the wicked. If you're not bringing the light up front, if you're not bringing Christ up front, we will always default that way. Even if you don't purposely do it, we default in the flesh that way. Religion will do that. Don't get me wrong. Religion is good. Because the Lord says, you know, the, the true religion is, is blessing the widows and the, the, the orphans. In other words, blessing the poor. 
Number five, I put down. One thing that keeps us from looking back, I mean, keeps us to keep looking back and, and wanting to go back to the past, wanting to go back to Egypt, and when we stop praying. When you're not praying, I guarantee you, you grow cold. You become complacent. You become indifferent. Your relation will begin to cease to exist, and you walk with Christ. Prayer is vital. That's our communication with the Father. You have to be in prayer, not like this, whether you like it or not. We can spend 8 to 10, 12, 15, 16 hours a day working, and we have a difficult time praying 15 minutes in the Father's presence. Yeah. We're hanging out at, at, at Disneyland for three days in a row, and an hour and a half in church. Oh, my God. <sighs> yeah. And at the game, at the club. Hey! Sorry, praising God. Hey, no problem running at the game, acting crazy. Yeah. Whoa, oh, I, 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 I don't, I'm embarrassed to go to the front and, you know, to be prayed for, to read. I'm embarrassed to, to raise my hand at the, go to the altar. Yeah, but at the club, you guys were in the club, boy. You weren't embarrassed of nothing. Acting crazy, acting a fool. Yeah. But at church, you still want to wear your wife's chonies. Yeah. Yeah. I don't understand that. <laughs> Ephesians 6.18 says this. And pray in the spirit on all occasions. Not just at three in the morning. Not just when you get up. Not just mid-afternoon between the hours of 12 and 12.05. On all occasions, with all kinds of prayers and, in other words, all kinds of requests. I'll repeat that part again. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. In other words, as you're praying, that's good, but it says be alert. Just because you're praying, oh, I've been praying, I'm cool, I'm alert. I can go in that club and not feel anything. You're lying. Just because you're a prayer warrior, that's, you need to stay out of there. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Let me tell you, every morning I pray, I also pray for all of them. I, I specifically pray for the pastors, the evangelists, the teachers, the, all those in the Middle East, all those that are in Afghanistan, those that are behind that curtain, those that are behind that wall. I pray for all the, the, the Christian people, those whose names are in the Land Book of Life. I pray for those who proclaim to be followers of the way. I pray for those that are seeking God and all those that are doing God's work. I pray for those people that love God. I, I, I pray a covering over them, a protection, that they will not be under persecution, that if they're in a prison, they're locked up. I pray that the Holy Ghost will move upon them and they will not feel the pain. They will not feel the insults of the persecution. But with that, in the midst of that mess, of that darkness, they will have the power of God come on them and God will use them in a mighty way. And if God chooses not to use them, I say, get them out of there. Bring them somewhere else. I pray for all those in the Middle East every single day that the Lord will bless those in those foreign countries that are seeking God because we think we have it hard. You should see what they're going through. They're going through crazy persecution. We need to pray for them every single day. I pray for them every single day. So what causes the bad thing? The sick thing I put down, the things we listen to. You'll see it's a little different. Watch this. Romans 10, 17. Consequently, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. So if we're not reading the word, our faith diminishes, diminishes and we become weak. I'm not talking about that nasty stuff on TV. Well, that's not good either. We're not talking about that. I'm talking about those things that, that, that if you're not reading the word, you're not hearing it. You're not hearing the right thing. And I guarantee you, you're going to get weak, and you're going to begin to diminish. And you'll begin to pull back in the things of God. You'll be less apt to speak when God has called you to speak. You'll be less apt to pray. You'll be less patient. You'll allow the, those little things, once again, that don't seem to matter, will compromise in those little things. It's important that we read the word always, constantly. Even if you just pull up a little pocket Bible in the middle of the day, just read one, read one verse. You don't got to sit down and read 75 chapters. <laughs> All you got to do, just read one verse, open your phone, 
You open your phone for all that other stuff. Open the phone and just read one chapter, one verse, one storyline. Get that word in you every single day. Always. The seventh thing I put down is laziness. Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. When we stop getting involved, we stop getting involved for the glory of God, for his kingdom. We stop working. This flesh will start. If we stop doing the, the godly work, the kingdom work, we will start doing the worldly work. Because in reality, a lot of us are more familiar with the worldly work than we are with kingdom work. And we will start putting in work. See, back in the day, I, when I served the devil, I served the devil real good. I put in an iron in my stripes with the devil. How many, of us, how, many, how many of us can tell the truth and put, say, you put in some time with the devil? The rest of you are putting time with the devil right now because you're lying to me right now. Yeah, we put in some time for the devil back in the days. Why not put in time for the kingdom of God? Amen. Don't be afraid. Don't, don't be intimidated by man. I don't care if you're short, tall, skinny, black. I don't care. White, green, orange. I don't care. Don't be intimidated by man. Don't be intimidated by strangers. Like I said, there's, there's no, in reality to me, either you're saved or you're not. So there should be no punks in Jesus. Either you're saved or you're not. You can't be in this in-between. Well, I'm in between. Like a tore-up truck, like a tore-up car truck, half primer, all beat up, saying in construction. Lying devil. You ain't done nobody working that thing in 15 years. No. Either you is or you ain't. You know, it's not proper vocabulary, but either you is or you ain't. There ain't no in this in-between area. <laughs> when we begin to compromise... In that seemingly, once again, little insignificant thing. Well, I'm not hurting anyone. That's okay. What's this big deal about that? And no one's ever going to know. My wife won't even know. And I'm just going to do it this one time because I'm having a hard day today. My boss or my wife, or my, I'm, I'm just going to do it this one time. And she doesn't even know that I got an extra $40 in my pocket. Nobody knows. It's not going to hurt anyone. And I can handle it. I guarantee you, you ain't going to handle it. Because if, you're, if your eyes are on God and, you, and all of a sudden you allow that one insignificant thing, I guarantee the devil says, that's all I need. The devil says, that's all I need is that one time. That's all he needs. All he needs is that one time. Almost done. Hebrews 10, 38, and 39. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back... I will not be pleased with him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. That's powerful right there. The process of, sink, of shrinking back, in reality, the devil, the enemy, makes it available to every one of us every single day. Every time you speak death with your tongue, you're shrinking back. Every time you lie with your tongue, you are shrinking back. Every time you do not speak when the Lord has called you to speak, you're shrinking back. See, we think we're okay just because we go to church. We're thinking we're okay because we pay tithe, we pay offering, we're thinking we're good. I've said this before. I know some people that, that give a lot of money, bro, to, to not necessarily the church, but to the poor. They give to the cancer victims, to foundations. They give hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're tore up. <laughs> they better... Excuse me, they better pray they don't die in their condition. So it's not based on what you're doing and you know, how much you're giving. It's not based on that. It's based, are we washed by the precious blood of the Lamb? Are our names written in the Lamb's book of life? And that's good. But in other words, if we're going to heaven, but if we're looking back, the scripture says we'll still go to heaven, but on this earth, if, if, if we keep looking back, it says we are not good for the service of the kingdom. I'm not satisfied. I don't want to just, oh, I made it, barely made it. I mean, like I say, I, I don't care what I do in heaven. I want to make it, but while I'm here, I want to bless whom God has called me to bless. I want to do work for the kingdom. I want to, I want to serve God in my, any way I can. And 99.9% .9 of the time, I don't know what I'm doing. I have to listen to God say, God, what do you want me to do today? What do you have for me today? If I allow myself to be used that way, you're going to begin to see doors open for you on a daily basis. 
So every morning I have to pray and say, Lord God, what would you have? I don't know, Lord God. I said, I need your discernment. You tell me what you want me to do today. Because if I don't hear from God, if God doesn't orchestrate that, I would do what my, it's like a routine. How many of you have ever driven across town and all of a sudden you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> I don't remember turning here, getting the freeway. How did I get here? Yeah. Because we do everything just by innate, because by, by, we're used to it that way, by habit. I don't want to do that. I say, God, you, you, need to, you need to open a door for me today. Bring somebody. Bring somebody to me. We, as you know, we have a, a, a sister that lives with us, with my wife and I. And just the other day, we had another family that come, another family of four that's living with us now. So I now I have uh, six other females besides my wife that are living with us that I'm helping. And it's difficult. So now I, I, got a whole, I got two other families that are living in my house. I have a five-bedroom house, and the rooms are all booked. And I could say, man, I don't want to do that no more. That's too hard. And I, and I I have to tell the Lord, Lord, you need to show me what you want me to do today. Because I'll make the wrong decision. I'll make a wrong choice. I need that discernment for God to show me what I need to do tomorrow morning. I need to, I need to see. Look, no, no, John, it's easy. If we will realize the power within us and what God has placed in us, the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of, of Jesus Christ, the light that God has given us, the precious blood of the Lamb that was shed on the cross of Calvary, if we will realize that anointing that is already in us, I guarantee you we will overcome every odd that the enemy encounters in us. Everything the enemy tried to throw at us, I guarantee you we will overcome it. If we put Christ up front, if you put Christ up front, I, I guarantee you that we will overcome every single thing. 1 John 4, 4. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. Because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Hmm. That tells me that as long as my eyes are on Christ, and in reality, if I would just stop for five seconds and think and put Christ out front before I do or I say anything, we will have this thing whooped. You see, but we're not putting Christ out front and we're not stopping and thinking for even a few seconds before we make those decisions. Before we say those words, we're not thinking. And we're causing a lot of injury in the lives of those around us because we don't stop and we think that we have the right. We think we, they, they deserve to hear what I'm about to tell them right now. No, they don't. When, you, when you're at your most darkest hour, when you feel the most anger, when you feel tore up, in reality, that's when people need to see the light of Christ inside of you. That's when we need to proclaim who he is in our lives. That's when we need to exemplify the light and the love of Christ that is placed within inside of us. If we say that, we're, that we have a relationship with Christ, I'll tell you like this, then just act like it. Prove it. Show, show Christ that you're in love with him. You know, every time Christ, the Lord tells us, you know, that we love him, but there's nothing that he needs from me or you. He, he doesn't need our worship. He has angels that worship him 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Endless. It says everything he owns, everything. He don't need my money. He doesn't. He doesn't need us. He, he, you know what he says? He says, like, he told, like I said a few weeks ago, he told Peter, "If you love me, Jesus, you know I love you, Peter. You know I love you, Lord. If you know I love you, I, I would die for you. If you love me." He didn't say, "Go to church and give a lot of money." He didn't say, "You know what?" I, 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 he said, if you love me, he says, feed my sheep. He, something that's so simple. If you love me, he says, feed my sheep. Thinking you, oh, I, was gonna, I thought I was going to hear something, man, crazy. If you love me, feed my sheep. Yeah. And did you know that those that proclaim they love him, that's the least thing that they do? Yeah. Because we're so busy and we're co so consumed with what it says, other gods. Oh, I don't got no gods. Yeah, we got the god of our job. Now, you, you don't work, you don't eat. But we got the god of money. We got the god of, of everything else that we put before him. The Lord says, everything's going to be brought in the open. Everything. I'm not satisfied where I stand. I'm not satisfied. Not in an ugly way, but I'm not satisfied. I'm expecting supernatural, powerful things to happen in you guys' life, in my life, in my wife, in my children, in my grandchildren. 
I pray for you guys every single day that you guys will just be in love with God in a powerful, powerful way. That the Lord will use us. Be very careful. Look at every, I'll close with this. Look at every situation on a daily basis as a tool that God is using to bring us a closer walk with him. Look at every difficult, difficult encounter, every obstacle, as God is using it for us to get closer with him because he's teaching us something. Amen. Don't take it as, oh, that's the devil. If it's the devil, then use it for God's glory. Amen. Yeah. Use it for God's glory, and you're going to begin to see there's nothing the devil's going to be able to throw at you. Nothing. Do not be discouraged. Always be encouraged in Christ. Always be encouraged with the word of God. Read the word of God. Pray fast. Seek him like never before. Pray every single day. Bless your loved ones. Bless your children. Love on them. Bless your pastors. Bless your leaders. A lot of you from other churches, you go back and you bless those pastors. You love them. I don't care. what. Then go cut their lawn. Because you're not doing it. You're doing it for, because of your intention, your heart. God will honor you for that. If you're a mechanic, you go to the church, you patch his car, break down, go fix his cars. If you need tires, go buy him tires. Yeah, if you go to the church, bless that pastor. Bless that ministry. Yeah. If that pastor's not acting right, lovingly go and correct him. If that church, that pastor's not reaching the loss, if they're not soul winners, go back to him lovingly and just help him. But encourage him. Don't, re, don't rebuke that way unless you have to. Just love and encourage them. You make sure the body of Christ that you're involved in is for God's glory, not man's. If they're preaching something not in the word, correct them. Help them. If, they're not, if they don't listen, cut them loose. Straight up, cut them loose. You listen to what God called you to do. Be careful, to, be, be careful how you listen to man. If it does not fall in line with the word of God, cut it loose. Make sure everything falls in line with the word of God. That he will be glorified. Amen.